this morning we're ready to go on a bird's eye view of quantum chemistry or like quantum mechanics, the application of quantum mechanics to chemistry. And before I start, I want to take it like really slow on you and tell you how chemistry, how theory was perceived at the dawn of chemistry. And uh, when you want to know what people think or what people did think, it is useful to look at a little quote from a philosopher, Isidore Comte, who said, any attempt to use mathematical methods for the investigation of chemical questions must be considered as completely irrational and as strongly opposing the spirit of chemistry. If mathematics will ever occupy a prominent place in chemistry, an absurd idea that fortunately is completely unrealistic, this would lead to a rapid and irreversible decay of the scientific discipline. Strong words. And so you see, there is an important difference between philosophy and science. In philosophy, you can claim whatever you want, whenever you want, how often you want it. Science is about the evidence. And indeed, the evidence proved this guy wrong. And now, from today's perspective, of course, it looks a bit funny, that quote. But it was not that long after that the founding fathers of quantum mechanics invented quantum mechanics Schrödinger and Heisenberg, wave mechanics and matrix mechanics, and then later Paul Dirac, who married quantum mechanics with the theory of relativity. So these are the giants, the shoulders upon we stand today, and everything they did lay a foundation for everything we're doing today in theoretical chemistry and physics. And it is fair to say that there is no experiment that is ever that has ever been done that is opposing quantum mechanics. So as far as we know, what these people did describes the world as we know it perfectly. And that is important. Ironically, of course, we all have heard of the Schrodinger equation as the equation that governs all behavior of matter. And that is, of course, right. But what we're actually doing in quantum chemistry is much closer to Heisenberg's matrix mechanics. Actually, these two gentlemen really didn't like each other. And so it's a, if you want for an interesting read, it is quite entertaining to read about the history of um, the Schrödinger equation or the Heisenberg <coughs> equation. So coming back to our subject, that gentleman, Paul Dirac, he made an equally strong statement. And in 1929 already, he said that the fundamental laws necessary for the mathematical treatment of a large part of physics and the whole of chemistry, all of chemistry, he means that all of chemistry, are thus completely known. You see, this is confidence. Yeah, completely known, and the difficulty lies only in the fact that application of these laws leads to equations that are too complex to be solved. These are equally strong words, and I think you could like look equally dumb if they were found to be true. But these words are found to be true, and indeed he followed it up with another sentence that is a bit less well known. He said, hence it would be desirable to develop practical approximation schemes for the application of quantum mechanics. And if you want so, quantum chemistry is just that. So in principle, the science of quantum chemistry is resting on that one statement of Dirac. And all we have been doing since 1929 is to develop approximation schemes for the practical application of quantum mechanics to chemistry. And indeed, it came a long way it went through various ups and downs. One of like the two up ups was Enrico Clementi, who in 1975 was already claiming we can calculate everything. Um, that is more in the category of the first quote that I put up. We can, of course, not calculate everything, nor probably should we even try to calculate everything. But what I want to convey to you is that calculations are a superb supplement to experimental chemistry. And you can get a lot of mileage out of these calculations if you combine it and properly combine it with the experiment. Blind trust in calculations is not what you should do. There is a certain tendency that you see that a lot also in published papers that people use a computer, use a computer program, and these days it's really easy. You will do fairly powerful calculations on your laptops. and. Uh, 
What you shouldn't do is like to just feed the computer, press the enter button, and then believe everything the computer tells you. It might be wrong in science when you're critical about your results. And at the end of the day, the answer will come from experiment. Yeah? So Max Planck once said that experiment is the only source of knowledge and the rest is poetry and imagination. So if you want to look at it this way, then theoretical chemistry is the poetry of chemistry. Yeah? That's a good place to be. And, uh, and it can be very enjoyable poetry and it can really lead you the way, but at the end of the day, it is people solve problems, not computers. That's important to remember. Yeah. So with that, we will look a little bit into the foundations of quantum mechanics and the foundations of quantum chemistry, and, uh, and, and look at it not from the perspective that you should acquire a vast amount of technical knowledge that takes physicists years to acquire, but like as a framework that you can orient yourself and this afternoon when you start to do calculations of your own, you might have like an idea of what in principle happens in the computer. So why would you want to do quantum chemistry? So first of all, you can predict quantities that cannot be measured. For example, you're interested in short-lived intermediates that never accumulate enough to be experimentally studied. In that case, quantum chemistry is the only choice that you have. Very important, you can interpret the outcome of experiments. For example, the science of high-resolution EPR spectroscopy these days is unthinkable without the input from quantum chemistry. So you get vastly complicated spectra that you cannot disentangle if you don't have a guy from quantum chemistry. There are many other forms of spectroscopy that, that profit enormously from quantum chemical calculations. And uh, it, especially for the practicing spectroscopists, it's a super powerful tool that lets you bring order and meaning to the peaks that you observe in the spectrometer. You can, and that is an important thing, and that involves your brain much more than your computer. You can obtain insight into the regularities of data. So you've got to realize that when you do a quantum chemical calculation, you do a calculation on a single molecule. But you might be interested in a whole class of compounds. That is something very different, and we will take up that subject again in the second lecture today when we talk about ligand field theory. So, but you can ask intelligent chemical questions to the computer, and you can study trends, chemical trends along series using quantum chemistry, and that is a fantastic way to obtain insight into the behavior of whole classes of compounds. You may also want to use quantum chemistry like to plan your experiments. Provided you can do these calculations faster than you can do the experiments, you can sit down and like predict the outcome of experiments. For example, if you want to design a molecule with certain properties, say magnetic properties, electric properties, or other properties, you may screen in the computer like what the outcome of these experiments likely will be if you trust your theoretical methodology, and then you can select the best candidate to be worth your efforts in the lab to make it. I'm sure you can think of many other reasons to wanting to do quantum chemistry, but these are good ones, and they should hopefully motivate you to study further. Now, what is the underlying physics? The underlying physics is deceptively simple. Now, if you look at a molecule through the eyes of a physicist, it will look like this. It will consist of positively charged nuclei that, to a good approximation, we can assume are simply point charges, and negatively charged electrons. And then there is just a single physical law that governs the behavior of all matter, and if you trust Dirac, of all chemistry. And that is Coulomb's law, which simply states that the interaction between two charged particles is proportional to the product of the charges of the particles divided by their distance. That is a single law, and it accounts for everything that is chemistry. All the properties of matter, all the reactivity, all the structure, all the beauty of chemistry contained in that one law combined with the laws of quantum mechanics. So that is encouraging. Um, however, it's complicated, 
because there are so many of these particles, there are many electrons, there are many nuclei, and they drag. So you have the nuclear nuclear repulsion, the electron electron repulsion, the electron nuclear attraction, and you have um, the kinetic energy of the electrons and the nuclei. Now, if you think about it, say you put all these electrons and, and these nuclei together and you give them an initial push and then they start buzzing around. That is like if you want to predict, say you have a billiard table and you give all the balls a push at the same time that they buzz around in a pretty complicated way. And so even if these things behave classically, they are complicated. Their motions are very complicated to calculate. That has been known for a long time in Newton's days people were studying the interactions of three particles and they couldn't solve it in closed form. So that is a famous three-body problem in classical mechanics. Well, <clears throat> then came quantum mechanics and people couldn't solve the two-body problem. Then came relativistic quantum mechanics, people couldn't solve the one-body problem. Then came quantum electrodynamics, people couldn't solve the nobody problem. So this is progress in theory. <laughs> Uh, but along the way, uh, incredibly useful approximations have been developed and today we are able to calculate, to solve the Schrodinger equation to very high accuracy for small molecules and, and the notion of what a small molecule is, is an ever-moving target and is expanding very rapidly. So despite their complexity, but it is worthwhile to remember that like deep down there just is a single physical law and that's, that's very encouraging. It's like, it's like hypnotic, it's hypnotic simplicity. So now we have to see how we combine this <coughs> with quantum mechanics. So in classical mechanics, you know that the, the motion of all particles are governed by Newton's equations. And Newton's are equations are equations that contain the positions and the momenta, so the velocity of each particle. And these are the unknown variables. And then if you solve Newton's equations, you obtain the positions of the particles as a function of time and the momenta of the particles as a function of time. And that is called the trajectory of a particle. And if you solve Newton's equations, you know absolutely everything that there is to know about that classical mechanical system. You know the trajectory of all the particles. And as you all know, in quantum mechanics, that is forbidden. And that is forbidden by the uncertainty principle. And by the uncertainty principle, we cannot know the positions and the momenta of all particles simultaneously. And instead, what you're allowed to know through the laws of quantum mechanics is so-called wave function that we will look in much more detail later. And the wave function does not give you a certain position and, prob and, and momentum, but it gives you a probability of finding the particles at a given point in time, at given points in space, with given velocities. We'll look at this later. Now the question is then how to go from <clears throat> the classical equations to the quantum mechanical equations. And it has been found that this is best done on something that is called the Hamiltonian formalism and that is called after uh, um, an astronomer, Hamilton, who rewrote Newton's equations in a form that most readily translates into quantum mechanics. And I'm sure all of you have heard the term Hamiltonian. It means a lot to some of you. It may not mean a lot to, to many of you. And when people talk about the Hamiltonian, they talk about the Hamiltonian formalism. And the Hamiltonian of the system just simply corresponds to the total energy of the system. And so if you take the last slide series, then we can simply write down the total energy of the system in terms, so that means we can write down the Hamiltonian of the system. And it consists of the kinetic energy of the electrons. And if you remember your physics lectures, you will see that this is given by the square of the momentum divided by twice, twice the mass of the particle. And then we sum that over all electrons. So this is the sum of all the, <coughs> the kinetic energies of each electron. And we have the same for the nuclei. And then for the remaining three interactions, they're just simply the electrostatic interactions. And so all we have to do 
is to put in <coughs> uh, put in the equation, and that for the electron-electron repulsion, that is simply the elementary charge squared, and then the sum over pairs of electrons, and here's the inter-electronic distance, and then you have the corresponding terms for the nuclear-nuclear repulsion, where the A and the B are the charges of those nuclei and the electron-nuclear attraction. Notice that this has a minus sign here because this is an attractive interaction and these are two repulsive interactions. So that is principle all there is to know. And uh, all of these terms are pretty easy except one. It will turn out that it is the electron-electron repulsion that is a difficult term in the Hamiltonian and like the last 80 years or so of quantum chemistry have been an uphill battle against the consequences of inter-electronic repulsion. But before I jump ahead of myself, we should continue on the basics. So in quantum chemistry, it is very convenient and very common to pass on to a um, special system of units. And that special system of units are called atomic units. And in atomic units, you have the wonderful feature that all of these awkward constants that you have seen on the last slide are unity. So h bar uh, equals 4 pi epsilon 0 equals e0, the elementary charge equals the mass of the electron are all 1. And the only natural constant that has a different value in atomic units is the speed of light that takes on the value 137.06. So that is not necessary, but it's convenient to, <coughs> to uh, do quantum chemistry in atomic units. All quantum chemistry programs <coughs> calculate internally in atomic units, and occasionally they also make printouts in atomic units, and then it's useful to know what they are, and it's useful to know how to convert them. I'm coming back to that. Second thing you have to do if you pass on to quantum mechanics <coughs> is to replace the momentum by its quantum chemical analog. Quantum chemical analog of the momentum is the gradient operator here, and that will provide you with the curvature of the wave function. I'm coming back to that. That is a bit counterintuitive, but in principle, just take it as a recipe that you replace the momentum by the quantum mechanical operator for the momentum. The third thing you have to do by passing on to quantum mechanics is and, uh, to do something, and we do that ad hoc, is to introduce the spin of the electron. So if you had a classical particle, it simply has a negative charge, and that's it. Now, in quantum mechanics, the electron has an additional degree of freedom, and that is its spin. And that is its spin, and it's, uh, you can denote it by sigma i, it's the spin of the i's electron, and in a fairly sloppy way, we can say it can only assume two values, alpha and beta. Yeah? And so if you combine that spin variable with the three spatial degrees of freedom, you give each uh, <coughs> electron a four-dimensional vector, x, that contains the coordinates x, y, d, that denote the position of the electron and its spin variable sigma. That is a bit odd, but it pops right out of Dirac's equation. So the spin of the electron you have to accept as an experimental fact. There is no classical analog, there is no classical justification. But there is something very important that is associated with the spin of the electron, and that is its magnetic moment. Because each electron does not only act as a point charge, but also as a bar magnet. And the magnetism of the electron is intimately related to its spin. So you will spend quite a while during the school to, uh, to, to study magnetic properties. And all of these magnetic properties at the end of the day arise from the electron spin of the electron. So now we have, we're equipped with everything that we need. We can write down Schrodinger's equation. And Schrodinger's equation for the many particle wave function, big psi, with coordinates with arguments x1 to xn, so there are n electrons and m nuclei, so the wave function takes as input <coughs> the coordinates x1 to xn, the m sets of nuclear coordinates, and time. And then Schrodinger's equation reads that the first derivative of the wave function with respect to time equals the action of the Hamiltonian 
on to the wave function. That is a so-called time-dependent Schrödinger equation. So if your Hamiltonian depends on time, if you have like perturbation, or if you have a, a time-dependent system that is evolving in time, the Schrödinger equation, <coughs> this Schrödinger equation will describe the system. However, we are mostly concerned with spectroscopy here, and so it's not the time-dependent Schrödinger equation that we're most interested in, it's a time-independent Schrödinger equation. And that arises if the Hamiltonian does not depend on time. And so the Hamiltonian that I've written down for you does not depend on time. So in that case, you can formally solve the Schrödinger equation in the time variable, and then you arrive at a simpler equation, that is the time-independent Schrödinger equation, and that is probably the one that is most familiar to you, and that reads, the action of the Hamiltonian onto the wave function equals the energy times the wave function. So that is so-called eigenvalue equation, and its solution is the wave function and the total energy. This is an equation that has more than one solution. So there is a whole set of possible wave functions that are solution to the time-independent Schrödinger equation, and each of them is associated with a different total energy. Yeah? And we'll look at that in more detail later. So the final step that you need to make before you're ready to discuss quantum chemistry is to introduce so-called Born-Oppenheimer approximation. And the Born-Oppenheimer approximation consists of neglecting the kinetic energy of the nuclei. What does that mean? That means that we look at a molecule by considering at any given point in time the nuclei to be fixed and the electrons adjusting to the positions of the nuclei instantaneously. And you can justify that in a heuristic way by saying that the nuclei are much heavier than the electrons, a couple of thousand times heavier, and then that means they move much slower than the electrons, and hence the electrons can immediately adjust themselves to any nuclear configuration. Yeah. So that also means that for any nuclear configuration, the nuclear nuclear repulsion simply is a number, it's a constant. Yeah. And that is so-called Born-Oppenheimer Hamiltonian, and that is the basis of pretty much all of the quantum chemistry you will do. It has very severe consequences, and one of the very important consequences is that the Born-Oppenheimer Hamiltonian creates a concept of a chemical structure. And that cannot be underestimated, because the fact that we can draw down chem draw chemical equations and like show molecules in the computer, we owe that to the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. Because if we only had like a smeared out probability for the nuclei, we could not draw a chemical structure, but we can. And it is absolutely central to the science of chemistry that we can draw chemical structures. And we owe that to the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. Yeah, so that we, that we can, can really pin down these nuclei, nuclei to nuclear positions. Yeah, so that is important. Uh, it also creates a concept of a potential energy surface that we will study in a few minutes, which is the energy as a function of nuclear coordinates. Mathematically, the Schrödinger equation separates into two separate equations. And now, the first one is an equation for the electrons, and so that is simply the action of the Born-Oppenheimer Hamiltonian onto the many part of the wave function equals the energy times the wave function. So that pretty much looks like the regular non-relativistic Schrödinger equation that I've shown you before. Now, the vertical bar here and R means that we remember that we solve the Schrödinger equation point for point at any nuclear configuration. That means we put the nuclei in some configuration, and we solve the Schrödinger equation, we put them in another configuration, we solve the Schrödinger equation, we put them in a third configuration, we solve the Schrödinger equation, and so on and so forth. Yeah, so that gives us the wave function as a function of nuclear coordinates and the total energy as a function of nuclear coordinates. Now the second thing, equation that emerges from that is an equation for the motion of the nuclei and that gives us the molecular vibration. So if we solve this equation, 
in which the energy as a function of nuclear coordinates enter, so that is so-called potential energy surface here, we will get out the vibrational wave function. And you know that, of course, from vibrational spectroscopy, like IR, Raman spectroscopy, that is the thing you need. Yeah? So what comes out of these equations are vibrational energies, and from the vibrational wave functions you can calculate vibrational intensities. In Parenthetically, I should notice that if you analyze the mathematical content of the Born-Oppenheimer approximation from a fundamental point of view, then the mathematicians will tell you that it's based on a serious expansion that is divergent. In other hand, words, you cannot really mathematically justify the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, yet it is absolutely central to our thinking and the application of quantum mechanics to chemistry. If that makes you feel uncomfortable, then you are on a fantastic way to become a fundamental theoretician. If uh, otherwise, I recommend you feel comfortable with it and just accept that it works, even if it shouldn't. Yeah. <clears throat> The Born-Oppenheimer Hamiltonian, and so you now we are down to four terms, is, uh, is deceptively simple. Yeah? It's a great achievement and it really describes 99.9% .9 of all chemistry correctly. There are, however, a few things that are missing and that we will need to add later if we study actual experiments. And of course, first of all, the Born-Oppenheimer Hamiltonian does not contain any terms that describe the interaction of nuclei and electrons with external electric and magnetic fields. And of course, spectroscopy is all about the interaction of molecules with external electric and magnetic fields, those that come with light wave or those that we apply in the laboratory. Then the Born-Oppenheimer Hamiltonian misses many small terms that uh, are associated with the electron and nuclear spins, and you will need this if you dive deeper into the theory of EPR and NMR spectroscopy. And tomorrow, for those of you who are interested, there will be a special interest lecture on effective Hamiltonians, where we will look at these terms and look how to incorporate that into the Born-Oppenheimer Hamiltonian. And how do we define a d-value and a g-value and a hyperfine coupling and all of these things from quantum mechanics? The Born-Oppenheimer Hamiltonian assumes a point-like nucleus for almost all intents and purposes that is just fine. It will break down, however, for very heavy elements when you really have to worry about relativistic effects. And, of course, it will break down for those spectroscopies that see an aspherical charge distribution in the nuclei, for example, the Mussbauer spectroscopy, as Eckhart Bild will tell you, there is something that's called the quadrupole splitting, and that can only be explained if you do not assume a point-like nucleus. However, for most intensive purposes, a point-like nucleus is just fine. Yeah? The Born-Oppenheimer Hamiltonian will also break down in situations where the separation of nuclei and electron movement is no longer well justified. That happens in a few very special chemical situations, for example, in Jan Teller systems. And I think that Michael Antanasov in his special interest lectures on advanced ligand field theory will uh, comment on that. Finally, the Born-Oppenheimer Hamiltonian needs to be partly replaced or supplemented with relativistic terms if you go down the periodic table uh, in heavy elements. So how far down do you have to go? So in the first transition series, especially towards the end of the first transition series, you definitely start to see relativistic effects and you cannot do calculations that totally ignore them, or at least you shouldn't. Uh, when you go, say, past the middle of the first transition series and anything that's heavier than that, you should do something about it. Now, the good news, that sounds scary. However, it turns out that the problem of how to incorporate relativistic effects into quantum chemistry is a relatively easy one. And uh, for, from a user's perspective, it is as easy as putting one additional keyword into your input file of your computer program. And so that is absolutely manageable. The science of relativistic quantum chemistry is a deep and complicated one. However, its practical application is straightforward. So that's a good thing. Okay, so now we come back 
and look at the solution of the born oppenheimer schrodinger equation and look at what it means. And the most important thing here to remember is the Born interpretation. It is not the wave function itself that is the physically meaningful quantity, it's the square of the wave function. Yeah? So the square of the many particle wave function that is written out here, it's psi star times psi. Yeah? It's a many particle quantity because it involves the coordinates of all of the n electrons at a given nuclear configuration. And the physical meaning of it is that this square gives you the conditional probability of finding electron 1 at position r1 with spin sigma 1, while at the same time you find electron 2 at position r2 with spin sigma 2 and so on and so forth. Yeah, so it is a probability conditional probability. That also means if you integrate that over all electronic and spin coordinates, you must find unity because your particles must be somewhere with some spins. Yeah, so that is a born interpretation of the many particle wave function. It is absolutely central to, to have that concept in your mind. Now the second thing is is, is a pretty strange one. It cannot be explained. It can only be accepted. It has been figured out by studying the atomic spectra of helium and it has been found to be absolutely true in nature. It's never violated. Never. Never. This is absolutely fundamental. And that is the Pauli principle. And many of you will know the Pauli principle from your elementary chemistry lectures as saying like <clears throat> no two electrons can occupy the same orbital. But that's not really what the Pauli principle is saying. What the Pauli principle really is saying is that if you look at the many particle wave function and you exchange the coordinates of two electrons, say we have xi and xj here, and we exchange them to be xj and xi, the many particle wave function must change its sign. That is totally strange. Obviously, now once you square the wave function, that sign goes away. But no many particle wave function that doesn't satisfy the Pauli principle is in accordance with the law of quantum mechanics. Okay, so now we have this many particle wave function, and it, con it, it consists of these n sets of coordinates, electronic coordinates with their spins. And the question is, how on earth do I picture it? Like, what type of picture do I have to have in my mind to, like, imagine that wave function? And the answer is, you don't. Because nobody can picture a function of that many variables. So the many particle wave function is beyond the capacity of the human brain to really understand. Yeah? That means the insight that you have to gain, you gain from elsewhere. And I'm trying to convey to you during these lectures of how you can get inside. But looking at the many particle wave function itself in four n variables, that is that is not happening. Yeah? That is simply too complicated. Actually, it turns out that the many particle wave function contains much more information than we will ever need. So in principle, you need objects of much lower dimensionality in order to interpret the outcome of all possible chemical experiments. So in principle, we would love to be able to have methods where we don't even have to calculate the many particle wave function because it is A, incomprehensible, and B, it contains too much information. I'm coming back to that at the end of this lecture. Now, if you look at that psi and you look at like funny bowl-shaped things that you see in your chemistry lecture, like orbitals, then you're on the wrong track. I'm not talking about orbitals yet. Yeah. So this is not an orbital. This is a many-particle wave function. That is the thing that is observable in principle. The square of <coughs> the wave function tells you what is observable. Orbitals are never observable. Yeah, they're not even fundamentals object, fundamental objects of the theory itself. You could do quantum chemistry by simply, like without a shred of humor, solve the Schrödinger equation, get the many particle wave function and the energy, and that's it. 
and you would never ever touch the word orbital. That would be totally fine. Yeah? That is the physics. The orbitals that we will talk at, at length with in that course, that you will run into in your chemistry lectures time and again, they help you to think about the system. They're little helper objects, but they're not fundamental. And they're not required by the theory. Okay, fine. Now that is a many particle wave function. Now let's look at the total energy. So what is that total energy E of R? That is the energy that is required to separate the molecule into non-interacting protons and electrons. Yeah? So you take, uh, actually, nuclei, not just protons. Yeah? So you take the molecule, you explode it, and you bring all constituent particles into infinite distance, where they no longer interact, and that is defined as energy zero. Yeah? So the total energy is a negative number, a large negative number that tells you like how much energy is gained when you bring the particles from infinite distance together <coughs> to your constituent molecules. So in principle that is observable. So you can in principle do that experiment and like completely destroy your molecules so that like all of your particles like flow away to infinite distance and then measure with some device like how much energy is freed by that. In practice, of course, you never do that. So the total energy in principle is a physical observable. In practice, it is not a physical observable. In chemistry, you measure energy differences. And these energy differences are very much smaller than these total energies themselves. In fact, that is a problem with the application of quantum mechanics in chemistry is that we look for very small differences of very large energy. So for even a moderately sized small transition metal complex, the total energy is something like 10,000 to 100,000 electron volts. Well, can be a million electron volts. Now chemically meaningful are energies that are on the order of 0.1 or 0.01 electron volts. So you're looking for incredible accuracy that you need to achieve in order to really predict chemical phenomena. Yeah, so that is about 0.05 electron volts. So and at that point it is very important that you're familiar with at least one set of units. Now if you're a physicist you like electron volts. If you're a theoretician, you like atomic units, and now the conversion factor is that one atomic unit is 27.21 electron volts. If you're a chemist, you like kilocalories per mole, and so one atomic unit is as much as 627 kilocalories per mole. What is a chemically meaningful energy is on the order of one kilocalorie per mole. Yeah, so when you want to do real chemistry in the computer, you need an accuracy of one kilocalorie per mole. Yeah? That is on the order of 10 to the minus 3 or 0.001 atomic units. Yeah? Now, total energy is hundreds of atomic units, and that should give you some idea of like, how much accuracy as a chemist you ask of us poor theoreticians to deliver in order to be useful. That is, it's an uphill battle that, uh, that has come a long way, but still is an uphill battle. Yeah. Okay. Now, as I told you, the Schrodinger equation has many solutions. Now, the lowest solution, that corresponds to the electronic ground state of the system. Yeah, so that is the ground state potential energy surface is the lowest solution of the Schrodinger equation as a function of nuclear coordinates. But that also means that you have all kinds of excited states, EI of R for I larger of zeros, and these are all the permissible electronic states of the system. That is the only thing you can observe. Yeah? So these are the states of the many particle system. I will harp on that time and again because you will find all kinds of misconceptions in chemistry textbooks and uh, or if you're like involved in say solid state physics or solid state studies then people talk about the density of states when they mean orbitals and it's all a big mess and confusion and you should Remember that in this world, you can only measure the many particle states and their energies. That's it. 
No arbiter is ever observable, ever. And everybody who claims the opposite is wrong. Yeah. I once had a math teacher, and the math teacher said, you know, I think, I think it is really great to have discussions and everything, but sometimes there is only one thing that is right, and that is what I'm saying. <laughs> so, I'm really sorry, but this is the way that nature is constructed, and the only thing you can observe are the many particle states and their energies. Okay. Each of these states obviously has their own many particle wave function, psi i of r. Now, just in terms of nomenclature, <clears throat> then several of these eigenvalues can be identical. And if there are n identical eigenvalues, then you say that the state is n fold degenerate. Now, the eigenfunctions that belong to the same degenerate eigenvalue are only determined up to an arbitrary unitary transformation. That may sound like gibberish to you. It uh, is of not much consequence for what we're talking about here, but if you like one star to apply it, um, then you may remember that there is something funny happening when eigenvalues are degenerate, and, and you can come back to that slide. Yeah. So now we need to start to label these eigenfunctions, and these eigenfunctions can be classified at least according to the three criteria. So there will be the total spin S of a given state, and we will have to discuss it a bit later, and we will come back to it in, in the particular field lecture. The spin projection quantum numbers, so these are both consequences of the total spin, and the overall spatial symmetry of a state. So if your molecule uh, belongs to a certain point group, then these states transform according to a given irreducible representation, and there is a spatial symmetry label. So that means each of these states, psi i, you can label with a quantum number for the total spin, a quantum number for the spin projection, and a quantum number for its spatial symmetry. So that would be a shortcut label for a many particle state. Now, in terms of chemistry, obviously you're most interested in the variation of the total energy as a function of nuclear coordinates. And so you would draw yourself a diagram where on the x-axis you have the evolution of nuclear coordinates, for example, an internuclear distance or an angle or a collective movement of many of the nuclei. And on the y-axis you would have the total energy. Now obviously these potential energies are multidimensional objects, and when I draw a diagram like that I just present a one-dimensional cut through it. Now, of course, you can do a classical mathematical curve discussion on that, and this potential energy will have minima. And these minima correspond to stable chemical species. Yeah? So these are, if you want so, isomers of the system. Or, if you look at a chemical reaction, they're the reactants and products of the chemical reaction. Now, if you pass from one to the other, then you have to overcome an energy barrier. And that energy barrier, that is a saddle point, and it corresponds, chemically speaking, to a transition state. Now, it is only a proper chemical transition state if it is a maximum with respect to one and only one of the nuclear possible nuclear coordinates. And if you are uh, think back to your chemistry lecture, they can be measured in normal mode. So there must be a single normal mode along which uh, uh, the energy maximizes that will give you a transition state. Now obviously that the energy difference between the reactants and products, that is the reaction energy, and if you combine that with a bit of statistical mechanics, what you get out there is the delta G of the reaction, and so basically an equilibrium constant. It will not pop out right away from your quantum chemical calculation because you will need correction for zero-point vibrational energy, for translational motion, for entropy, and so on and so forth. There are useful approximations for these things, but there is more to it than just solving the Schrodinger equation. Yeah? But conceptually, <clears throat> what you should pick up is that this energy difference here is related to equilibrium constants, and hence it is related to chemistry. At that point you can also think about 
electron attachment and detachment reactions that would give you then a redox potential, or you can think about proton attachments and detachments that would give you pKa value. So here is a lot of your chemistry. Yeah? Here you decide whether something is like exergonic and endergonic and so on and so forth. So that means all of your chemical thermodynamics is here. Now this energy difference here, that corresponds to a reaction rate. Yeah? So when you want to calculate the rate of a chemical reaction, what you have to find are these transition states. Now locating these minima is relatively straightforward. Locating these transition states is relatively hard. But in all of that, it is not that you just like toss the coordinates into the computer and say, computer program, tell me what the structure is. Because the outcome of that uh, exercise will depend on where you start. So when you like go to the computer this afternoon and start to do these calculations and then, then optimize geometries, you will have to realize that the computer program only finds a structure or a minimum that is the closest <coughs> to where you start. So if you put in a really unreasonable structure into the computer, you either get no result or you get a very bad result. So it really is your chemical insight that goes into where you start these, these calculations. So if you start them here, close to the minimum, they will go in a few steps down here. If you start them here, they will never arrive there. Yeah? So that is important. You, you, it, it is your responsibility as the user of a quantum chemistry program to put chemically meaningful structures into the computer that can also optimize to something meaningful. And that is only the only way you will find chemical transition states is by having a chemically motivated good guess of how that transition state will look like. If you don't have that, you will not find it. Good, so that is chemistry. Now spectroscopy is associated with transitions between the many particle states that I've talked about. And so these are mostly transitions from the electronic ground state to excited states of the system. And we will spend the rest of the week like walking you through all kinds of various spectroscopies that have all their own laws and all their own uh, nomenclature and culture to talk about. But in principle, it's always the same. It is the transition between <coughs> electronic states of the same system, and they happen with a certain probability, and that certain probability is given by uh, Fermi's golden rule that tells you that the intensity of a spectroscopic transition is proportional to the matrix element between the initial state and the final state, and H1 is a perturbing Hamiltonian that describes the radiation field. Yeah, so the radiation field also has a Hamiltonian and there are oscillating electric and magnetic fields associated with the light wave. We will look at that in much greater detail. And if you evaluate these matrix elements, that gives you Fermi's golden rule and eventually lets you predict the intensity of spectroscopic transitions. Now when you talk about spectroscopy, it's important to realize that there is a logical energy scale that is associated with that spectroscopy. And that various spectroscopic techniques see very different molecular phenomena. Now, if we order that by energy, and I think it is most logical to order these spectroscopic methods by energy, then <clears throat> you start, say, with gamma rays, 14,000 electron volts, that corresponds to an intranuclear transition and that would be Mus Bauer spectroscopy, as Eckhart Bill will tell you about. Now, at a few thousand electron volts X ray absorption spectroscopy, you go to X ray absorption and emission and also extended X ray absorption fine structure. And that is a subject that Serena and Pierre and her students will bring to your attention. Now, at one through four electron volts, you are about in the energy range of a chemical bond. And the spectroscopy that corresponds to it is absorption spectroscopy and it's many, many variants like magnetic circular dichroism or circular dichroism spectroscopy. So you should realize that like when you start with photons of energy 1 to 4 electron volts, 
you are in the energy range of a chemical bond, so you really study directly the chemical bond here. You do much more brutal experiments here where you excite core electrons and in the extended X-ray absorption fine structure you even eject electrons out of the deepest lying core levels into the continuum. So you really like destroy the system. It's a, it's a very high energy spectroscopy. Here you are at the chemical bond. So anything that has lower energy than optical spectroscopy just looks at the consequences of chemical bonding, not the chemical bond itself. That is why optical spectroscopy is such an important spectroscopy because it directly looks, lets you look into chemical bonding. Yeah? It is also why there is the field of photochemistry, right? Because you can split bonds with visible light and make bonds with visible light. So that is a, is a key, like a central spectroscopy to chemistry because it is directly looking at bonds. Now, if you don't have enough energy to excite a chemical bond, then you excite molecular vibrations. That is infrared and Raman spectroscopy that, uh, that I will talk about to you on Friday. Uh, I forgot to say the revisible spectroscopy will be talk, <laughs> brought to your attention by Felix Tukchek from the University of Kiel. Then if you go further down and you cannot even excite a molecular vibration anymore, you go to microwaves, the 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the minus 5 electron volts, that is EPR spectroscopy, it simply flips electronic spins, and if you go even further down by 1 to 2 orders of maximum in photon energy, you're at radio waves, and there you have the spectroscopies of NMR and NROR spectroscopy, where you simply flip a nuclear spin. Uh, down here I've written to you the various energy conversions and they're really useful to remember. So if in case of doubt when you, when you like, want to come to one common energy scale and it can be electron volts or wave numbers or kilocalories, it's not important but you've got to be aware of like, the many orders of magnitude in photon energy that these methods stand. So we now, the rest of the time, will look at uh, methods to approximate the solutions of the Born-Oppenheimer-Schrödinger equation. And of course, the first question is about how do you solve the Born-Oppenheimer-Schrödinger equation? And the answer I have given already in the beginning is you can. You cannot solve the Born-Oppenheimer-Schrödinger equation, not even for the helium man. It's not possible to do that in closed form. So hence, we got to like live Dirac's legacy and look at approximation methods for the solution. We really need them and they have been refined over the years to, to fairly impressive accuracy. So now for the simplest of systems you can get very highly accurate solutions. So we're talking about so uh, 38 figure accuracy so you can solve the Schrodinger equation for small systems much more accurately than you can measure. That means if you make a new measurement that gives you another digit in measured accuracy, it will simply agree with the calculated number. And it has happened. And it's true. So for very small systems, you can confidently solve the Schrodinger equation to high accuracy. Now that is of no concern to you because when I say small systems, I mean like H2, H3, H3 minus maybe, yeah? so really, really, really small. For the chemistry that you are concerned with, I'm concerned with, that accuracy will not happen for a long time to come. So we need approximation methods and there is a certain logic in these approximation methods. So all of these methods want or aim at approximating the solution of the many particle born Oppenheimer Schrodinger equation. Now, logically speaking, the easiest to grasp is which we will look at uh, in, in some detail in a minute, is Hartree-Fock theory. That is a mean field theory, it's so also called the independent particle model for, for a reason that I will talk about to you and it captures most of the, of the solution. Yeah, it, it, it goes a long way towards the solution of the Schrodinger equation, but it's not good enough. And so there is a whole family of post-Hartree-Fock methods 
that go with names like configuration interaction, many body perturbation theory or couple cluster theory. Alexander Auer in his uh, special interest lecture will talk more about these methods. We will only scratch the surface of what they mean here. But in principle, using these methods, it's possible to very closely and systematically approach the exact solution of the born Oppenheimer problem. It's a major intellectual achievement and it has happened in chemistry, not in physics. This is a genuine achievement of theoretical chemists, not of theoretical physicists. Figuring this out and figuring quantum mechanics out, that is something that the physicists have done. So these are the shoulders of the giant we stand on. But like implementing it and making it practical, that was something that the chemists have done. Now you can, you will see that the computational cost of these things becomes very quickly pretty large to the extent that you cannot do these calculations anymore and hence you look for simplifications and very drastic simplifications is to introduce empirical parameters and simplify down, neglect terms and simplify it down and that's what has happened in semi-empirical quantum chemistry. So semi-empirical quantum chemical methods are many orders of magnitude faster than hartree fock or post hartree fock methods. Uh, however, you pay for it by limited reliability and semi-empiricism. This is totally parameter-free. There is nothing. Yeah, that is called up initial methods because there is nothing you can fiddle with. Yeah, that these are, in principle, only governed by constants of nature. It's the absolute no-nonsense way to theoretical science. Yeah? Now, if you don't, even, if you even then throw away <coughs> uh, electronic structure, you can simplify from semi-empirical to force fields, and say with hartree fock you can maybe do a few hundred atoms. With semi-empirical theory, you can do a few thousand atoms. With force fields, you can do a few hundred thousand atoms. So the largest simulations that have been done on the basic of force fields was like to simulate an entire virus on an atom by atom basis. So this is basically where, where people stand. Now there is a different theory that is fundamentally different in its philosophy and we will study it towards the end of that lecture a little bit and that is density functional theory. And most of theoretic quantum chemistry that is being done today is being done on the basis of density functional theory. It is dominant to an extent that many people equate these things with each other. They say if they want to do have a theoretical study, then people are asking, can you do the DFT for me? That of course is fine, but it's missing a very important point, and that is density functional theory is a sub-branch of theoretical chemistry. It's not theoretical chemistry itself. It is dominating the market today, and it's questionable whether it will still dominate the market in like say five to ten years from now. And there are good reasons to believe that it's not. For the moment, the DFT is your workhorse. But you've got to be aware that there is more than DFT, and DFT is not systematic. So DFT delivers an accuracy that is somewhere intermediate between hartree fock and post hartree fock at the cost of hartree fock or even faster than that. That is its great appeal. But it's, um, it's entirely for practical purposes that it's so popular, it's not for philosophical purposes. Certainly not. Okay, so now let's look at what is Hartree-Fock theory and how can we even start to develop an approximation. And there is something that is called the variational principle. And the variational principle is our best friend when we try to solve the Schrodinger equation. And look at this object here. That is so-called width functional. It's the expectation value of the Hamiltonian, so the total energy over a trial wave function divided by the norm of the trial wave function. So that means you have opened your grandma's drawer and you found a trial wave function. Yeah? So if there was a wave function, you take it out, you look at it and say, how good is my trial wave function? And if you want to know, then you insert that in the Ritz functional, because the Ritz functional will tell you something, and it tells you that whatever the trial wave function is, when you evaluate the Ritz functional, you will get something, you will get an energy. 
an energy as a functional of that trial wave function, and that will always be larger than the true total energy. Unless your trial wave function is the exact many particle wave function, at which point the Ritz function returns to you the exact total energy, say of the electronic ground state. So, but that is fantastic because whatever you do with that trial wave function, you always end up too high. But that is great because that means you can like make up a trial wave function that has flexibility. Yeah, so that is that you can squeeze, that you can change the shape of the trial wave function. And so say you make it flexible with a set of parameters P, whatever these parameters P are. That means you can now minimize the Ritz functional with respect to these parameters P, and you know you always go into the right direction. Yeah, so that means the more flexibility you build in, the lower down you can get, and that means the closer you can approximate the true solution. That is great. Yeah? So what you're looking for then is the stationary point of the Ritz functional, which is defined by the partial derivative of the Ritz functional with respect to all of these parameters <coughs> being zero. So that is great, but of course, I told you the many particle wave function is incomprehensible in its complexity. So how can you come up with a trial wave function? There was a super smart guy called Hüttermas who could make up like a many particle wave function for the helium atom and he obtained absolutely spectacular results in the 1920s and 30s for the helium atom that are still good today. Now that was two electrons. Add one more electron, you're out of luck. We can't imagine it anymore. So you needed some starting point of how to think about a trial wave function. And then we come back to what I told you in the beginning. And in the beginning I told you that the painful term in the Hamiltonian is the electron-electron repulsion. So we can, for a second, just imagine the electron-electron repulsion would not be there. And then the Hamiltonian would just be a sum of terms that involve one electron at a time. Now here mathematics sets in. That's why it's good to talk to mathematicians because they will tell you that in such a situation where you have a differential equation that consists of terms that are uncoupled and that involve one variable at a time, you can make a so-called Bernoulli product ansatz, and then the solution of the many particle problem simply is a product of one electron solutions. Yeah. Now that is a super major simplification. It is actually the first calculations on atoms were done by a pioneer called Hartree. And he used a wave function of that type where he used a many particle wave function as a product of one particle wave function. That was before the time there were even computers around. So what did Hartree do? He employed his father, who was a retired engineer, and he solved iterative differential equations on a piece of paper. That guy must have been the same. That uh, must be the most boring thing on the planet. But Hartree <laughs> obtained these, uh, these solutions, and they were already pretty good. But they were missing one thing, and that is the Pauli principle. And so, <coughs> When you have a product of one particle wave functions and you exchange the coordinates of two sets of those coordinates, then it will not change its sign. And that was very clearly realized by Slater. And so Slater repaired it by making up what is now known as a Slater determinant. And that is a very important object of the theory. And so the Slater determinant writes as a trial wave function trial wave function. This is not an exact wave function. It's a trial wave function, the many particle wave function, as a product of one particle wave function. So this is uppercase psi, so everything that involves many electrons in our notation is uppercase, and that involves one electron is lowercase, and so we, here we have lowercase psi. I tell you in a moment what they are. That involve the coordinates of one electron at a time. No? And then we have a product of those. Now, if you know the laws of determinants, 
that if you multiply this out, now you will get all permutations of electron labels and orbital labels. Yeah, so you will have the coordinates of electron 2 in psi 3 and in psi 17 and so on and so forth. Now, that means whatever you do such a coordinate transformation, you exchange rows or columns of the determinant, and then the laws of determinants tell you, because later you as mathematics, that it changes its sign. Conceptually, it is nothing else but that. It is taking the solutions of one particle problem and writing an anti-symmetrized product uh, of, of one particle functions as a trial solution for the n particle problem. So that is absolutely fundamental. That's why it's called the independent particle model. Now, what are these guys here, lowercase psi, psi 1, psi 2, psi 3, psi n? These are orbitals, one particle wave functions. Yeah? So at this point, orbitals are entering the formalism. And they're entering out of despair, yeah, because we had the scary many particle Schrodinger equation in front of our eyes and we can't solve it. So we write it, we, we like pretend that these electrons are not interacting, and then the appropriate form of solution is this later determinant. Okay? And not even that is enough, because now what we can do is we insert that Slater determinant into the Ritz functional and then we can vary the shapes of these orbitals. Yeah? And so we can try to squeeze these orbitals as much as we can to minimize the energy. That would be our hartree fock solution. And we cannot even do that because the shapes of these orbitals are complicated. And so you even now need to approximate the orbitals themselves. Yeah? So, so, so think of the hierarchy. We had a many particle wave function that we approximate by a single Slater determinant in order to determine via the Ritz function of the orbitals. Now the orbitals themselves we also need to approximate because their shapes are too complicated. And this is where we expand each of these orbitals in terms of an auxiliary set of functions, and this is called the basis set. Now, that basis set phi is such that if it has a mathematical property of being complete, then this can be an exact relationship. Now, it is only, will only be complete if it's infinitely large. But we cannot calculate with infinitely large basis, we have to truncate it. And that <coughs> means we have to use a finite basis set, which also means it will not perfectly represent the true orbital. That means we have a basis set truncation error that is a curse of quantum chemistry. It is entirely unphysical and we don't like it and we really don't like it and we would love to get rid of it, but we have it. So in whatever calculation you do, you will have a basis set truncation error that you cannot avoid. But you can control it, you can study it, and you can learn about it. So now we have delegated the problem of finding the orbital psi i itself to the problem of finding the expansion coefficients c mu i. And c mu i, that is simply a matrix. Mu is the index that labels the basis functions. The basis functions we have to provide. And obviously there are standard sets of basis functions and they have funny names. They have, they say like 6, 3, 1, G star or def 2, SV, parenthesis, P, and so on and so forth. In the practical course, you will learn to know what these things mean. They are simply collections of pre-fixed functions phi that are stored internally in the computer program and that help you expand these orbitals, and then what the program needs to do is to determine these expansion coefficients c. And this is the subject of so-called hartree fock rotan equations. They're from 1949, and they're the fundamental basis of pretty much anything we're doing. And it turns the Ritz functional into a matrix eigenvalue problem. And that matrix eigenvalue problem is now not one for the many particle wave function, 
but it is one for the one particle wave function. So in doing that, in going from the many particle Schrodinger equation to a quasi one particle Schrodinger equation, you replace the Hamiltonian operator by an operator that's called F and that's called the Fock operator. We will look at it in a moment. Now the Fock operator has the nasty property of depending on its own solution, C. So in principle you have a matrix eigenvalue equation that depends on its own solutions, which is the very nature of the Hartree-Fock problem. So that means you've got to solve this iteratively. I come back to that in, in a moment. And of course these iterations is something that you as a user of a computer program, you will sit in front of the screen and will watch the stupid computer doing stupid iterations and eventually hopefully converging. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. And uh, you have a certain control over that convergence and that means you as a user of a computer program needs to babysit your calculation into, into a better solution. So that is the hartree fock rotan method. Yeah? But in, despite of all the details of whether you understand the mathematics here in detail, so there is a clear hierarchy. We approximate the many particle wave function by product of single particle wave functions with are the orbitals, and we determine the orbitals through an energy minimization process that is justified by the variational principle. So, and what comes out of that is obviously the orbitals and the orbital energies. Now look at what these orbital energies are. They are the expectation value of the Fock operator over these orbitals. So in principle that gives you something that is a one particle energy. I, there is more to it that I will tell you in a second. <coughs> and it corresponds of like the kinetic energy of the electrons. The energy interaction of the electron in psi i with the nuclei and then an average interaction between the electrons. And in Hartree-Fock theory that has two contributions and that is important for you to understand. So this thing here, that is a two electron integral. And that two electron integral has two components. One of it is the Coulomb integral, and that if you now read with me what that is, that is the integral of psi i squared with coordinates of electron 1 times psi j squared with coordinates of electron 2 divided by the electron-electron interaction operator. So what that means, <coughs> this here is a charge distribution. <coughs> One electron in orbital psi i, and so that's a smeared out charge distribution. Psi j is another smeared out charge distribution and that is the interaction energy between two electrons at any given point R1 and R2. And that is the integral over all possible such arrangements. So that is simply an electrostatic interaction energy between two electrons with smeared out charge distribution. So that is entirely classical. Hartree actually pulled this term out of his pocket when he did his first atomic calculations. He was simply guessing it because it is so intuitive. Now the second term here is not intuitive at all. And that is so-called exchange integral. And so here you see you have psi i with coordinates 1 and psi j with coordinates 1. So this here is not a charge density, it's an interference density if you want so. And then you have the same here with coordinates of electron 2. So that is the self-interaction of an interference density, if you want so. Does that mean much to you? No. Does it mean much to me? No. But um, it is something that is, that is fundamentally important in the theory of the many-particle problem. And the reason this term is there is the Pauli principle. If you did not have the Pauli principle, you would not have this term. The important point that I want to make here, you all have heard about exchange in chemistry and many of you will have heard about the exchange interaction. There is no exchange interaction in nature. There never has been, there never will be. This term here comes simply from the anti-symmetry requirement of the many particle wave function in combination, <coughs> uh, in combination um, with the electron repulsion. So that is simply the electron repulsion together with the Pauli principle leads to the exchange integral. 
Yeah, so it is the self-interaction of an interference density. It's purely quantum mechanical. It has no classical analog. Now it is not trivial, but possible to show that this integral here is always positive. Yeah? And this integral is always positive because this is positive, this is positive, this is positive. So it always gives a positive contribution to, to the energy of the electron. Whereas this integral here is multiplied with minus sign, so positive integral multiplied with minus sign, that always gives a negative a stabilizing contribution. You can also easily show that this integral is only non-zero if both of these orbitals here, or both of these electrons, have the same spin. So that means the exchange integral is favoring electrons of the same spin. That is the important message. That's why, intrinsically, in hartree fock theory, it loves high spin states. It loves parallel spin electrons. In fact, it loves parallel spin electrons way too much, way too much. Um, but that is subject of another discussion. So at that point, I only want you to notice, so in hartree fock the energy of each electron is the average field kinetic energy times the electron nuclear attraction, and then there is the average electron-electron repulsion that has a contribution to a Coulomb and an exchange integral. So the physical picture in hartree fock is the following. Each electron moves in the field of the nuclei and the average field of the other electrons. That's why it's called a mean field theory. It's not because the field is mean, because, but it, that there is an average field of the other electron that each electron moves in. Yeah? And it's also called the independent particle model. It's also called the independent particle model just because it came from the fictitious situation where the electron in electron interaction was present that let us choose the unlearned for the wave function. So now how do you solve the hartree fock equations? And uh, as I said, it's, it's a fairly boring uh, iterative process in which you have to guess some starting orbitals. Now don't get nervous, you don't have to guess the starting orbitals. The program that you use will guess some starting orbitals for you. Then you calculate the Fock operator with the present set of orbitals. Then you diagonalize it to obtain new orbitals. You calculate the total energy, check for convergence. And if you're not converged, you go back to here. And then you do this, and 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 this. And this. Sometimes it converges in like 10 iterations. Sometimes it converges in 25 iterations. Sometimes it converges in 125 iterations. And sometimes it doesn't converge. Uh, then you have to change something. There are tricks and, uh, that you can play on the program to make it converge, but you have no guarantee for convergence. At that point, you need to go to your best friend, which is the manual of the computer program that provides like useful hints of how you babysit your calculation to converge. You can also get angry at the programmer, but that doesn't help your conversions either. <laughs> At the end of the day, it's uh, something that involves your patients. Yeah? Okay, now how good is hartree fock theory? Now consider the neon atom. The neon atom, we know what the exact experimental energy is. And how do you obtain that? You simply sum up the 10 ionization potentials that you can find on the internet in some tables. And if you convert it properly, it comes out to minus 129.056 hartree's. Okay, now what does hartree fock give you? hartree fock gives you minus 128.547. So first of all, this is too big, yeah? As I said, this is great. The variational principle is right. The energy that you get is too big. So that looks like stellar, doesn't it? So we have calculated using hartree fock theory 99.6% of the exact energy. Now obviously even the neon atom has a bit of relativity in it and so if you subtract that out then you come to about 99.8% of the correct energy. Normally you would say if you approximate something to 99.8% accuracy you have done a fantastic job and you're done, right? And you call it a day and go for a beer and say, wow, wow, wow it was great. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately it is here where the conversion factor works so much against us as I said, one heartbeat equals 27.21 electron volts. 
And one electron volt equals 23.06 kilocalories per mole, so one heartbeat is 627 kilocalories per mole, and that means this tiny little 0.2% error amounts to 319 kilocalories per mole error. As I told you, if you want to do chemistry properly, you are aiming for one kilocalorie per mole accuracy. That means you're about two orders of magnitude of your accuracy goals. And that is where one can easily get depressed, right? One said, I did such a good job, like approximating the solutions of this complicated equation. And now nature is telling me I'm, I'm off by two orders of magnitude and I need to go two orders of magnitude better. So that is a very hard problem. But even that problem has largely been solved. First of all, it is solved by error compensation, right? Because we never need to calculate the absolute energy, we need to calculate relative energies. And the second thing is, by all the work that the quantum chemists put in to get that 0.2%. Yeah? So you see why quantum chemists need to be incredibly nitpicky people. That is because they're scratching the last 0.2% out of, of nature's total energy. Yeah? Now that is then the picture that you have to have in your mind. So we've covered this one, the mean field hard before, where each electron moves in the field of the nuclei and the average field of the other electrons. Now what's missing from that is instantaneous electron-electron interaction. So basically when two electrons simultaneously bump into each other, that is so-called dynamical correlation energy that is missing from Hartree Fock. Now it turns out that you can always write that exactly as the sum over electron pairs and now electron pairs come in only two flavors, electron pairs of electrons that have the same spin and electron pairs of electrons that have opposite spin. Now of these two, one is easy, that is the so-called pair correlation energy of electrons of the same spin, that is called Fermi correlation. And as I told you, a lot of it is there already in hartree fock yeah, due to that exchange integral. We say there is a Fermi hole in the mean field. So this is relatively easy to cover. Now the really hard part is the correlation between electrons of opposite spin. So that is extremely hard to calculate because these electrons can come arbitrarily close. They can even occupy the same point in space. The many particle wave function has a funny behavior at that coalescence point, it's said to have a cusp. Now, the bad thing is, if you calculate, do a good job on this and a bad job on this, your calculation is totally out of balance. That's why if you do a hard to calculation on a transition metal complex that totally overemphasizes this, you always end up with high spin. Yeah? So even like, say, cobalt 3 hexamine would come out as a high spin complex in Harvey Fox theory, which is completely wrong. That means inside Harvey Fox theory there is a tremendous bias in favor of high spin states. And you have to work so hard with post Harvey Fox methods to get this part in, to get it back into balance. This is why calculating transition metal complexes with their many unpaired electrons and their, and their spin states is such a hard thing to do. So before I leave that subject and, and let leave the rest to, to Alexander Auer to explain to you, I give you the picture how, how to possibly think about the dynamical correlation because it is hard to think about. So you can think about the, the electrons in your molecule swimming in a sea and that C is the Harvey Fox C. And then all of a sudden, when they, and they sit in their occupied orbitals, and all of a sudden, when they bump into each other, they jump out into the unoccupied orbitals. Now, what you have to calculate in these post Harvey Fox methods is the probability for these jumps to occur. Now, you can think about jumps of one electron, two electrons at a time, three electrons at a time, four electrons at a time, five electrons at a time, and so on and so forth. All electrons at a time would give you something that is the exact solution that is known as full CI. Now, to calculate the probability of these jumps, that is like 
really that's the tough stuff. And uh, one uses methods that ultimately were developed by physicists. You use like nice little funny diagrams and you come up with kilometer long equations for it. And uh, if you're into that kind of thing, it's real fun. And, uh, the only thing I want to like bring to, to a general audience attention is that this is a systematic way of approaching the solution of the many particle Schrodinger equation and it becomes reality even for larger molecules. So, for example, we have done last year a, a fairly good calculation on an entire protein. So, in the, in the foreseeable future, these good systematic and accurate methods will be reality for the largest part of chemistry. That's a good thing. and. Um, I think I want to spend maybe 10 more minutes on density functional theory. but uh, So I will skip over this, the interpretation of the hartree fox solutions. I've said many things uh, already through the lecture. And I want to come to a totally radically different approach to the many particle problem, and that is density functional theory. So now forget everything I told you about hartree fox theory and we start from scratch. Now, you can catch a glimpse of what people were thinking with this graph. So what you see here is the CO molecule. Well, you don't see the CO molecule, but you see the electron density of the CO molecule <coughs> in the plane. So the CO molecule is laying here, and the electron density, you can see, has a nice spike at the cusp at the position of the carbon nucleus and at the position of the oxygen nucleus. Now, obviously, from the electron density alone, you can already deduce a lot. From the position of these cusps, you can tell where the atomic nuclei are. From the height of that cusp, obviously, carbon has fewer electrons than oxygen, from the height of the cusp, you can tell the identity of the atom. Yeah? So there is a cusp condition here on those nuclei. And from the height of the cusp, you can tell which nucleus it is. From the integral over the electron density over all space, you can tell the number of electrons. So these are things you can deduce from simply studying the electron density alone. So for example, if you have highly accurate electron density from experiment, you could do that. Yeah? And so that means you can reconstruct the Born-Oppenheimer-Hamiltonian itself from just knowing the density. Okay? Is that logic clear? So you can identify the nuclei and their identity from the position of the cusp and the height of the cusp and from the integral over the electron density you know the number of electrons. So you can reconstruct the Hamiltonian. And so now you can set up a logical cycle. So if you know the electron density you can deduce the electronuclear potential and the number of electrons from which you can deduce the Born-Oppenheimer equation and hey, if you could solve it, you would know the exact answer. Cool, isn't it? But um, honestly speaking, we've been there before. Yeah. So like an hour and a half ago, we've been there and we couldn't solve the equation, right? And we still can't. Yeah. So even if like we can't arrive at that point with two more additional steps, we still can't solve the equation. Now, what was worth the Nobel Prize? is the realization that, in principle, it should be possible to bypass that step that we can not do and to directly go from the electron density to the exact energy and the many particle wave function. So that is the magic of DFT, and it rests on two theorems. These are known as the holdberg hold theorems. And the first one says that exists a unique functional, E of rho, and that gives you, like once fed the exact electron density, gives you the exact energy without solving the Born-Oppenheimer-Schrödinger equation. Of course, we don't know the form of that functional, but it should exist. The second theorem establishes if you have a trial density and you put it into that universal functional, the energy you get is always too high just like the Lips functional, so you could have a minimization process if you would only know that functional. Okay, 
<laughs> that is uh, where it stands at the moment. And so if we look at our heart refog uh, energy, we can already like get an idea of how you can write things in terms of uh, the electron density alone. And you will find out that nuclear repulsion is trivial because it doesn't contain the electron density. Then the electron nuclear attraction you can easily write in terms of the electron density, so that is good. Then the Coulomb part of the electron electron repulsion you can also easily write in terms of uh, the electron density, so that is also okay. So what's missing then? is the kinetic energy of the electron and the exchange and correlation as a function of rho that you don't know. Yeah? So that is a useful way to proceed, of which this one is and remains magic, whereas the kinetic energy of the electrons and that made the entire method practical is relatively easy to come by, and that is the so-called Kohn-Scharf construction. So remember how in hard Fox theory we invented the system of non-interacting electrons. Now that is the exact same thing that Kohn and Scham did when they invented kohn sharp theory. And everything you're doing here in the computer during that entire week will be kohn sharp theory. So it's worthwhile to listen to what it is. So they also invented a system of non-interacting electrons. But rather than like like justifying an approximation for the wave function, they did something more radical. They demanded that the electron density of the non-interacting system is identical with the electron density of the interacting system. So you have a reference system that has no electron-electron interaction. Yeah? So its solution is a single Slater determinant. But its electron density is the exact density that you have in the interacting system. And what that lets you do is to write the biggest part of the kinetic energy just as you did in Hartree Fox theory from the solutions of the fictitious one particle system. These are psi i's. They look damn like Hartree Fox orbitals. And in practice, they really do look like Hartree Fox orbitals a lot. Yeah? But what it lets you do is to sneak in that kinetic energy that you couldn't express comparatively as a function of the electron density. So what you have then delegated is all the unknown into the exchange correlation functional plus a small correction of the kinetic energy. Now if you walk that through, then you end up with a one particle equation for the fictitious non-interacting Slater determinant and that looks a lot like Hartree Fox theory. It's just that you have replaced the exchange <coughs> term in the Hartree Fox method by an exchange correlation potential that is local, and that is the functional derivative of the exchange correlation function with respect to the electron density. So now that is mathematical gibberish that you don't need to pay much attention to it, but I, I think that the important point is that you have this fictitious reference system, you have the exchange correlation functional, and it leads you to a local potential and a type of Schrödinger equation that you can, like a kind of Hartree Fock equation that you can solve. So in practice, when people turn their like developed DFT programs, they took their Hartree Fock programs, dumped the exchange term, and put that exchange correlation term in. Yeah? So that is all there is from a practical perspective. Now, obviously, it all depends on like how good of a functional you can guess or come up with uh, will determine how good your solution will be, how good your energy will be. And it is here where hell breaks loose because there is uh, probably like five or ten new functionals every week and people do all crazy kinds of stuff. So most of it is, is uh, motivated by studying things like the homogeneous electron gas, very far from what a molecule really is. Now it is useful for you to like, really understand where we stand with DFT today to look at these potentials and you can calculate the exact potential. So you can calculate near exact potentials 
and you can ask how good are the DFT functionals that we use today relative to these exact potentials. Now that is the argon atom, <coughs> that is the exact potential for the argon atom and this is one of the approximations that is so called PBE functional. And so what you see here, it is not so bad, however it falls off far too fast and that is why DFT is not good in studying weak interactions. Yeah? The potential is much too short-sighted. It falls off as 1 over r squared, where it should fall off as 1 over r at the long range. So you see this is minus 1 over r, and the exact potential goes nicely to one, minus 1 over r. The approximate potential doesn't. You would say it's also missing like some structure here at the shell boundaries between the 1s, 2s, and the 2s, 3s. However, that is probably less serious than the wrong asymptotic behavior. But hell breaks loose if you look at these correlation potentials. So that is a near exact correlation potential, and that is a correlation potential predicted by the PBE method, yeah? one of the popular functionals. You would probably agree with me that these things have almost nothing in common. You could even like multiply the PBE potential by minus 1 and you would have a better approximation to the true potential. That means, make no mistake, DFT rests on the cancellation of enormous errors, qualitative errors, qualitative failures. You can use it and you can use it to wonderful advantage in chemistry, but I mean the physical truth is this. It is not very realistic. The only no-nonsense way to solve the Schrodinger equation is to go via wave function theory. And the only reason this doesn't happen on large scale today is because these wave function methods like cost too much. But that is an approachable problem that partially has been solved and will be made available to the general public in the near future. This is not what we want to stay with. So when you do DFT, don't hit the enter button, trust the computer, there is more to it. Yeah? Got to be critical. Okay, my last slide probably, and then I should stop. So DFT, as useful as it is, it still has big problems. Now look at this, this is a nice example. So you have like a linear hydrocarbon, octane, versus an isomer branched isooctane. I don't know what your chemical intuition says, which one should be lower in energy, but I would probably say this should be lower in energy, would be my intuition. This is not true. The branched one is lower in energy by a little bit, just 2 kcal per mole. Now Harvey Fogg gets it totally wrong by 12 kilocalories per mole, almost, yeah, and predicts this one to be more stable. You do get it right with wave function theory, that gives you a result that is spot on the experiment. Now if you do any flavor of like modern DFT, you get it as wrong as Harvey Fox theory. So this is like with B3 dip, the most popular functional. It is still wrong by more than 10 kilocalories per mole. Now you very often will read papers where people tell you, I use my B3 dip functional and hence my energies are accurate accurate to 2 kilocalories per mole, and hence you've got to believe me what I'm telling you. That is not correct. Yeah? So even the simplest of hydrocarbons, you can have errors of 10 kilocalories per mole, and that's why it is so important that you seek a connection to experiment, and there is no better way to connect to experiment than spectroscopy. Don't just believe these energies. Very often they're good, but more often than not they're bad. And it's science when you're critical against your own results. So that's all I have to say for now. We make now a 10-minute break or 15-minute break, and then we continue with the interview. Thank you.